If you could just uh, just briefly uh, go over your amateur wrestling career. Amateur wrestling. I've been an amateur wrestler since 1969. So I started doing the math on that one. I uh, started teaching amateur wrestling by 1971, uh, my peers. And then by 1972, I won my first national championship. And so I always say, simply say, and, and when were you born? 1982. So I just, just again, I, I just know that uh, that I've been been uh, competing longer than most most my opponents and their partners have been been alive. It doesn't say I, I, to me. It's, it doesn't say anything really uh, against me. If anything, it says something for me for a sheer fact that I'm I've been out there for this multitude of decades, and I'm still in my mind. I still have a goal of nine more years of what I will be doing. And even in that nine years of still doing something, uh, phys of being physically active, I will have transitioned myself into other sectors to where I will never truly retire, uh, but I will transform more and more into that speaker, doing things on the corporate uh, scale, things of that nature. So I already have, you know, my life, I have it mapped out. I just have to live about three more lives on top of this one just to get the current to-do list done. So uh, would you say that winning the national championship, obviously that was a big accomplishment. Uh, you also uh, got second at the Olympic trials one year. Can you tell us about that? Ooh, you're at opening Pandora's box there on that one because uh, you and I would not even be talking today had everything gone the way it should have gone for me in my amateur wrestling career. I would have retired back in 1984 as the Olympic gold medalist. That actually was my goal. But it did not work out quite that way. I ended up being the alternate. So I had to sit up in the, the bleachers and watch the man ahead of me win the gold medal without giving up a single point. Everybody that he went against, I had pinned in under one minute. So it was going to be the easiest gold medal for me to have ever won. Even that was at the 220 pound weight class. Even at heavyweight, Bruce Baumgartner was a representative. Everybody that he went against, I had pinned in underneath one minute. So I could have gone at either or weight class and would have done just fine. But uh, I'll say that that is what then motivated me from that point on uh, to, uh, to pursue other endeavors. Jeff Blatnick, who is one of the play-by-play uh, -play, uh, commentators for the Ultimate Fighting Championships through, let's say, UFC number four, five, six, and about another dozen after that. Um, he's no longer, I mean, he just been gone for, for a few years now. Um, Jeff was a former amateur wrestler as well, Olympic uh, gold medalist. And in 1984, Greco-Roman uh, wrestling had at the heavyweight weight class. And... Uh, in some of his closing comments that he said to me at uh, UFC number five, he goes, Dan, he goes, I was with you back in 1984. I know what you went through. He said, did you ever imagine in your wildest dreams that here by 1995 or 96, you would be the number one cage fighter in the world? I go, Jeff, no, I would never have imagined that. I said, just think, if the world would have seen me while I was in my prime, what what real animal they would have saw. And how did you end up getting to pro wrestling? Because I understand that you were actually a pro wrestler before you were an ultimate fighter. Correct. Uh, how I ended up getting to become a professional wrestler, um, I had been approached by smaller independent companies through the mid-80s. But had I turned pro at that time, I would have lost my amateur status and no longer would have been able to compete and try to make national teams, world teams, and ultimately an Olympic uh, team. So I, I turned down those offers through the 80s. Well, as of the 1992 Olympics, a new ruling came down that allowed athletes to be both amateur and professional simultaneously as long as you weren't involved in, say, a high school athletic program or a collegiate athletic program, because you'd still be governed at that time by the uh, High School Athletic Association or the NCAA uh, rules. I was well past my collegiate eligibility, so I could have my cake and eat it too. 
So that's when I first turned pro. I was a head wrestling coach of the Michigan Wrestling Club. The president of the club was a, a gentleman by the name of Dennis Kasperwitz. His professional stage name was Denny Cass. And so when business would be conducted, would be finished on behalf of the amateur wrestling, I would always stick around for another 15, 20 minutes and I would pick his brain about the world of professional wrestling. And he painted a very dark picture about it. And he said, think about it. And he goes, if you still want to then pursue it, he goes, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. And basically, uh, I, I thought about it and I wanted to pursue it. And that's when he took me down to Lima, Ohio, and then uh, introduced me to uh, a Body Slammer's gym ran by the legendary Al Snow. And uh, I guess you must have been a bit of a pro wrestling fan then, if you were. Uh... Watched it, uh, I'd, I'd say probably more in my junior high years. You know, having four other brothers, uh, roughhousing in the living room, and it seemed like to grab your brother, to airplane spin him a half a dozen times, and then to body slam him on the couch seemed like the, uh, the natural thing to do, taking out usually a lamp in the process, breaking a leg or two on, on the couch itself, uh, on top of uh, springing a spring or two on, on the couch. But yeah, I, we enjoyed uh, doing, uh, doing those kind of antics there. And, and then, uh, like, like I said, when uh, 92 hit and this opportunity came along, I thought it would be my, my only chance of living a lifestyle of a professional athlete. So I thought, I have nothing to lose. Why not chase this dream? Was there any uh, wrestlers that you kind of looked up to when you were watching it as a kid or uh, feared, perhaps? Well, I mean, watching it, um, I, I don't the, the fear aspect, I don't, I don't think, really was there. I, I saw it all as the, uh, well, I don't know, maybe I'll mix, mix it up. There was the entertainment aspect that, that uh, I was intrigued with, but at the time there was the, the Junkyard Dog, there was Bobo Brazil, there was Flying Fred Curry, there was Leaping Larry Shane, uh, the original Sheik. These are the people that I was watching uh, at the time. And uh, you know, I, was, I was thoroughly entertained by the, the different characters that were involved in this because there was like no two wrestlers were the same. There would be the, the tag team action, there'd be the singles action. Um, as I simply refer to it now is professional wrestling is like a three ring circus with a side freak show. And it still is that. I mean, there's usually there's something in it for, for everyone. If they don't care for this aspect of it, they will probably enjoy this other aspect of it more because there's scientific wrestlers, there's flyers, there's brawlers, there's everything that falls in between. And then, like I said, there's the uh, tank matches and then there's the there's midgets, there's giants, uh, women wrestlers, it, it has it all. What did you think of the original Sheik uh, being from Michigan? Uh, he was obviously a huge superstar today. Well, I did uh, actually end up wrestling on his promotion uh, on a few different occasions with his, with his brothers and that and then uh, his nephew, Sabu, uh, also, you know, getting to know him, being on shows with Sabu, and actually wrestling Sabu a few times. So... Was he like his character in real life? I understand he was... Are we talk, which one are we talking about right uh, now? The original Sheik, Ed, Ed Farhad. You, you know, I, I, me personally, I never met him. Oh, okay. I never met uh, the original Sheik, uh, so... Uh, all I can say is I, I really couldn't tell you what's whatsoever, but uh, you know, just. Well, what what are your memories of Sabu then? Well, <laughs> there's there's probably only so much I want to say on tape, and then that would be more or less probably saying off tape. Let's just say that I'm actually kind of surprised she's still alive because of the risk that he continues to take. Um, you know, my stock, when people ask me about professional wrestling, I, I, I st travel with three belts, excuse me, four belts. Three from the Ultimate Fighting Championships and one from the world of professional wrestling. I have my own copy of the NWA belt that was given to me by the legendary wrestler. Um, boy, I can't believe I just, just did that right. Luthez. Uh, so, you know, as much as what Ric Flair would always like to claim to be the man, Luthez was the man. 
and to have been able to meet him in Japan, him and Billy Robinson at the same time. You know, they came from that old school of wrestling uh, where, you know, the strap was would always be put on a shooter. And so that, that from those old carnival days, when the announcer would be standing inside the ring with, alongside the champ, and he'd be announced that any man, woman, or child that could last five minutes with the champ gets $10,000. That was a legit announcement being thrown out to the crowd, knowing that whatever poor local would come out of that crowd into that ring, that champ was going to put down hard and fast. So now when Billy Bob goes back up into the ring, uh, goes back up to the crowd, bloodied, battered and bruised, the, the, the locals all thought it had to be real. Look what just happened to one of our own. And that was the premise of, of the old carnival days of how the industry was built and then professionals could go on and could conduct business as usual. But uh, What was Lou Fez like as a person to meet? I mean, a down-to-earth type of person, you know, just he, he, very, again, that old school, shake your hand, lick your eye-to-eye uh, eye eye and stuff like that. Uh, you know, the first time, I, I guess, I think probably the first comment he ever made to me was he was kind of just watching me because uh, I, was, I was over in Japan and I was working for this company called the UWFI and I was just in, in the ring and I was just kind of training with a couple of guys and, and the first thing he says, he goes, I really like your mechanics and what you're doing out there. And I go, I said, well, I said, sir, because I, I did not know who he was at the time. I go, well, sir, I thank you. I said, uh, these are just mechanics I've learned through my career of amateur wrestling and just how to utilize a man's body weight and momentum against him and, and so on. And he just, you know, he went on to, you know, I became a, a great uh, a great friend with uh, Lou and with uh, Billy Robinson. And, and, you know, they got a chance to just share a great deal of wealth of, of their knowledge with me at, as well. So that was, I felt really privileged that they opened that door, which I don't think they probably did to, to very many people. And you mentioned you were trained in uh, pro wrestling by Al Snow. Uh, Al Snow was, I'll say, one of my trainers. I mean, it was, uh, and a number of abundance of, of older wrestlers. I did not get a chance to train with Al all that long before actually having my very first professional wrestling match inside of a penitentiary of all things. So the baby faces were booed and the heels were cheered. So it's definitely a reverse psychology all the way around. Um, and then ironically, I mean, uh, you know, talk about, you know, they talk about a Brock Lesnar being a crossover. They talk about uh, uh, how uh, Ken Shamrock has gone from yeah, MMA fighter to professional wrestler and back again. But you know, a lot of people they, again they don't understand. He was a professional wrestler before, just like myself. I was an amateur wrestler, professional wrestler, and then going into the, the cage fighting type stuff. And and now with uh, Tito Ortiz, uh, King Mo, uh, Brock Lesnar, uh, the list goes on of how many guys that have been that combination of of amateur wrestler, mixed martial arts, professional wrestler, and even the Ultimate Fighting Championships, Dana White himself has used like the WWE as a business model because it works and has applied that to the Ultimate Fighting Championships. Scott Coker with Bellator, he has taken certain scripts right out of a professional wrestling manual and has used them inside there because they work. It's just hard to find athletes to have that capability of being able to do things in both worlds. So prior to your UFC career beginning, uh, was there any highlights of your pro wrestling career that, that you remember? Um, let's see. Well, other than my very first match being inside of a prison and just things that uh, were, should have traditionally worked did not work. Um, I really questioned what I was getting myself involved in before ever, before even doing it. Uh, I went down, you know, with, with uh, Dennis, D Dennis Cass, I went down with him to a couple of shows and I was watching all the dynamics. I was watching what was happening inside the locker room. I was watching uh, the wrestlers in, in their preparation were going out to their matches and I was watching the matches, but I think what I was watching more than anything was the, the crowd 
watching the matches, seeing how they got so evolved in, in particular matches. I really, I really questioned what I was getting myself into, and and uh, yeah, I, I think, I think almost every professional wrestler has to come to grips with certain beliefs in that before ever really pursuing that career. I think a great movie that de depicts it is the movie The Wrestler, um, with uh, Mickey Rourke was the, uh, the star character of that, paints it as a very dark aspect and I think that that is something that I think any aspiring professional so should watch that movie first and then they're probably going to think to themselves, well, it's just in movies. No, I would say that that applies to a vast majority of the professional wrestlers that get into it. I can't use that as a broad sweeping stroke, but uh, at the same token, yeah, it's an industry that uh, it will, I think it will shave some years off of your life. And I think it will reduce some of the quality of your life as well. And there's a story I was asked uh, to ask you to tell uh, from superstar Billy Graham about an encounter you had with him. <laughs> superstar Billy Graham. First time I met him, of course, he was a man mountain at that time uh, out in Phoenix, Arizona. I was working for a weightlifting company by the name of Olympic Enterprises. I was the assistant wrestling coach for Arizona State University at that time. You know, but with that whopping salary of $3,200 a year, I had to make my, my salary another way. So I actually worked uh, a regular uh, job at a manufacturing plant. And Billy Graham happened to, be, uh, happened to come in that day. He knew the owner. And he, I don't know how long he was staying in, in Phoenix there for, but he wanted to get some pieces of equipment. And he wanted to have them delivered to his apartment. So one of the other um, employees there and myself, we delivered these couple pieces of equipment and there had to be this high-low lamp machine uh, that would not fit through the spare bedroom door. And so he just hit me, asked the, uh, one of the other guys that was with me, because go down to the manager's office and ask to borrow an ax. And then when, when he brought back the ax, Billy Graham proceeded to chop out this doorway to, so that this piece of equipment that could, that could get in. And after he got tired, I chopped for a while. He's like, here, I need some help. You guys chop for a while. So we're thinking, here's a guy, he doesn't own this apartment. And here we are ch helping him chop this doorway out so this piece of equipment could fit in there. And did we oblige him? Yes, we did. <laughs> so that was my first encounter ever of meeting Billy Graham, superstar. <laughs> so you went from being a, a pro wrestler into the, the very first UFC. Uh, how did you hear about the first UFC? Well, I mean, they can educate people because, you know, people think that, you know, the UFC is on everywhere, but pay-per-views were not like that. In the beginning, they were only being shown in major metropolitan areas. Uh, so I was living in Coldwater, Michigan, a very rural area, never heard of the Ultimate Fighting Championships. So a friend of mine out of Detroit happened to watch the first two. He recorded them on an old VHS, excuse me, VHS tape, and he showed it to me. And he says, hey, you got to think about doing this stuff. And I'm watching people get soccer kicked in the face, teeth are flying out. And I'm like, you know, these are not exactly skills I possess. But he says, hey, look at this skinny little guy doing jujitsu. Of course, he was referring to Hoist Gracie. And uh, I had never been exposed to, to jujitsu at that point in time. But I thought, oh, kind of looks like wrestling to me. And I figured if a man was close enough to throw down upon me, I either step back, get out of range, or I close the distance before he gets any real mustard onto it. And that little premise right there has actually served me quite well over all of these years. So uh, that's how I heard about it. Um, I simply filled out an application, sent that on in. Nobody ever returned my phone call. I was, I was told that they were receiving a couple hundred applications on a daily basis. So I just, my, my stuff just got lost in the, uh, the woodworks. So just a, a couple phone calls were made to the office to one of the owners, Art Davey. 
are Davey and Jorge Gracie were the first two original owners of the Ultimate Fighting Championships. And I happened to be going out to Los Angeles on a professional wrestling card, wrestling Hawk of uh, the Road Warriors. So uh, um, our Davey came out, watched me in my professional wrestling match, and then he conducted his personal interview afterwards. And the very first thing he ever said to me was, you do realize what we do is real, don't you? I don't know what he was trying to insinuate about professional wrestling because I always tell people when they see those four belts, I'll say they all recognize the UFC. And, and then, then they'll see the NWA belt and they'll say, well, what is that? And I said, that's, well, that stands for National Wrestling Alliance. It's a professional wrestling belt. And they're like, professional wrestling? And I go, well, kind of like what you would see on television, WWE, TNA. And they're like, wow. They, and they'll say, you mean the fake stuff? I say, well, no professional wrestler ever likes to hear the word fake because to be picked up and to be bodily slammed, to be hit with chairs, I said, I said, that takes impact, that takes force, and, and there's trauma to the body. I said, my stock answer about professional wrestling is professional wrestlers are some of the most incredible athletes doing some of the most incredible athletic maneuvers without the aid of a safety net. Okay, now with that said, I go, you see these four belts here? You do recognize these three back here, the UFC belts. I said, what you, what you, you might be surprised to hear is I've been hurt far worse in my, for that one single belt there for the world of professional wrestling than I have been in all three of these belts combined. And that boggles their mind. So uh, you were accepted, obviously, into UFC 3, I guess it was? Four. four? Yeah, number four is my first one. Okay, and what was, what was it like going into that? Uh, were you nervous at all? Did you know what to expect? What was well, no, actually, I, I, I don't think really I was nervous at all because uh, I had no time. Uh, I only trained for five days, an hour and half a day, and that was just because my workout partners got too tired too quickly. Um, my training camp was actually held down in Lyme, Ohio, at Al's uh, Body Slammer's gym. Um, a professional wrestling ring was the closest thing that we could come to a cage. Uh, not like nowadays. I mean, uh, back then there was only one cage in the world, and it was owned by the Ultima UFC. Now, I'll bet you can go into almost any community, and you will find a cage somewhere in somebody's gym or a section of fence in someone's gym that you can work on wall, cage wall tactics and that. But at the time there wasn't. Professional wrestling ring was the closest thing I could come to. And so I went down there with uh, Al and a couple of others, professional wrestling protégés. And uh, they had one pair of old boxing gloves between the three of them. They simply just rotated. Once you got tired, you traded the gloves off the next guy and he traded them with the next guy and they would punch, kick, and do whatever submissions that they knew of to me and I just kept avoiding being struck and used my amateur wrestling skills to clinch, throw, take down, and just limpy slap on amateur wrestling moves and make them scream or squawk. And that was my training camp. And people say, well, what does amateur wrestling moves do for you? Well, what a lot of people don't realize is that in the world of amateur wrestling, you are learning principles of leverage. But what does that, every, that leverage equal? It equals pain. You're not out there tickling somebody to roll them on the back, to pin them. You are, you are, you are imposing your will. You're using mechanical leverage. You're putting them into pain. That's the only way that you're going to be able to put them on the back and actually pin them. Okay, so, and how did that first uh, event go for you? Well, I mean, for someone that put in such a little effort in their, in their preparation, I, I think I made my mark quite well. My very first match ever going against uh, Anthony Macias. No one had ever seen uh, another man pick up, pick up a man and basically launch him, bodily launch him, and that was with the belly to back suplexes that I did to, to him a couple in a row. Now, what they'll never know about this, had I pulled off the very first move was going to be a belly to belly, but because Anthony Macias, his body, he was like covered in baby oil. And again, that's a rule now that has been put in place at the time. It was carte blanche then. My arms slipped from his waist and went all the way up to his armpits. So when I threw the first one, I landed on my own back and shoulders and stuff like this, where had I been able to grip down nice and low, would have launched him. The front of his face would have hit, 
and not the back. And that would have been a very devastating impact had I pulled off that. And what were exactly the rules uh, going into UFC 4? Well, it, it was very, very minimal. You only had two rules to abide by, and that was no biting, no eye gouging, no weight classes, no time period, bare knuckled action, and they had the eight man tournament. You had to face and defeat three opponents in the same two hour pay per view that still runs to this day. But most people are familiar with the terms mixed martial arts. Mixed martial arts, that phrase really has only truly been coined since about the middle 2000s. And mixed martial arts has approximately 37 rules that pertain to it. Whereas unlike the NHB or that no hold barred era only had two. And what was the prize money like in those days? Tournament winner walked away with $50,000. So a far cry short of what, what, it, what the guys walk away with today. But at the same token, I can't complain. I, make the, I made the most money at the time. But talk to what a football player uh, made 20 years ago, what did a basketball player, what did a hockey player make 20 years ago, it differs from yesteryear to what athletes are making today because of better endorsement deals, better sponsorship deals, things of that nature. So it's just a different world altogether. So I can't complain. And did you think that this would be a sport of the future when you first participated in it? I knew it had quite the attraction. Um, how do I equate it? Uh, kind of like an accident. When you're driving down, why does everyone slow down to leer over at the accident? They don't want to look, but they look, nevertheless. When I had that first VHS tape that was given to me, it might be, I, I, I might have just put it in, Some, one of my buddies might have just stopped by just for a moment, just to drop a tool or something like that off that he had borrowed for me. But he he catch a glimpse of what was on the television. He goes, what's that? Well, all I know is that they were they were in a hurry just to swing by, just to drop some off because they had to rush right on. Well, an hour later, they're still on my couch, yelling and screaming at the television set. So I kept thinking, again, I'm watching them more than I'm watching what the content is on television. I kept thinking, well, I already knew that people were people are drawn by violence. I don't know why, but they are. It's, an, it's, it's quite the attraction where people gather just to watch, uh, some, whether it be pugilistic or, or just a good old-fashioned ass kick, and I, I mean, I just, or something else to fall somewhere in between the two. But people are attracted by violence, and I simply have taken, you got two men inside of a cage, and there's only two rules. How much more plainer can it get than that? And I'm guessing there was no steroid testing in those days. Nada. <laughs> there would be uh, a lot of the guys that uh, during that time period uh, would have been interesting to, to have seen if a test could have been taken retrospect now to see how many guys could have passed. And I believe Hoist Gracie even failed the uh, drug test. As well. match against Matt Hughes, he, fa he failed that one. So Which, when, you, when you faced uh, Hoyce Gracie, would he have been drug tested for that match? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, at that point in time, no. It's the, uh, that type of testing, again, I think really only came about somewhere in that middle 2000s. Uh, you know, going back again, they're just a, the, the, for the history lesson, the three different ownerships of the Ultimate Fighter Championships, Horian Gracie, Art Davey, first ownership, they sold it to Bob Meyerowitz, of the Semaphore Entertainment Group uh, in, out of New York. And then Bob Meyerowitz probably owned it at the worst time because that's when you had Senator John McCain that was rallying all the different uh, other senators, athletic commissioners, politicians, and legislators to do away with this barbaric sport, it's this human cockfighting. It was, it was referred to as a lot of different things. And uh, poor Bob owned it at, at the worst time and actually had, it went out to... Uh, Las Vegas to to uh, to plead to the athletic commission to find out what changes could be made so that it would become a more susceptible sport. And again, what you had to look at is 
all these boxing commissions were were headed up by boxing people. And so even when this, this new kid on the block is coming, it was it was a threat to the boxing industry. So a, a lot of things took place that I, I probably were unethical. Probably still continue to take place in, in, in different parts of the, of, of the country, different parts of the world, because of, of the, the threat that mixed martial arts has to the boxing world. And it's really, it's, it's a, it is its own separate entity. There, there are still box events, just like there are kickbox events, just like there are wrestling events. It's just that in this arena of mixed martial arts, it's just that opportunity of throwing all of it together. Myself, I would have never pursued a boxing career, a kickboxing or a Muay Thai career, because I did not possess those skills. But knowing that I can use my amateur wrestling background, I felt secure in that aspect because a man's got to be within arms or legs reach in order to kick or strike me. And I kept thinking I'm pretty good about moving back or moving in to uh, either circumvent or to clinch them before they're able to do anything. And that's even if you go back in time and were to look at the very first Ultimate Fighting Championships, it looked like the Wild Wild West because you did have so many different people from different industries of athletic backgrounds that were one-dimensional. And I throw myself in that same category. You might have had just a boxer going up against a karate guy or a jiu-jitsu practitioner going against, say, a savat or a sumo that went up against a boxer. I mean, just... It was style versus style, and because the question that usually comes up time and time again is, when did this, the sport first evolve? I said, and I always tell people, as of UFC number one, because as people are watching this and they're, they're realizing, you're okay if you're on your feet and you got all this striking power, but what happens if you get clinched or taken down? And so the striker, excuse me, the grapplers, which was the category I fell into, we had to learn defensive mechanisms, how not to get hit, or, how, or, or one or two things to learn how to strike on out to where you can get to those clinches, jam them against those uh, cage walls, or get those takedowns. And then the strikers realize, well, I'm okay while I'm on my feet and I have space. But now I have to learn survival skills, how to defend from being taken down, how to get, get off those walls, how to get back up off the ground. So the sports start evolving from the very first event to 21 years later, you have strikers that can grapple with the best of the grapplers and grapplers who can strike with the best of the strikers. So the sport has gone a uh, complete 360 revolution and it's only been around 21 years. My prediction, even way back then, I said wait until the sport has been around about 23 to 25 years. Because now you have that young man or woman that has grown up with the sport that is now 23 to 25 years of age. They took Taekwondo, they took Judo, they took boxing, they took Muay Thai. They, they immersed themselves in so many different sports. They might have even did a youth MMA program. And now they've got almost 20 years of experience when they are walking into their cage for the very first time, you're going to have the, the, the athlete of the future, not only just skill-wise, but because there's, there's supply and demand, there are so many athletes trying to move into this market. What's going to separate you from the rest of the pack? And I think you will start to see those cage walls used in ways you would have never imagined. I mean, as it is, you've seen people use their, their toe, like I call them like monkey feet, the way they can actually walk up them and help, help turn themselves over. You've had some people already that, uh, if you're pursuing me backwards, bounce off this cage and come up with a Superman punch, a flying knee. Uh, now that you're seeing people step off and do head kicks, I actually think it will go on to, to the next evolution. And, and again, it's an extreme type of uh, scenario I'll paint, but I can make you mad in a match. 
and you pursue me across that cage. And literally, I run right up the cage wall, do a complete backflip, slap on a rear uh, naked sleeper hold on you, and before my feet ever touch, have you knocked on out. Now that's giving you an extreme example, but I think that's where this sport is heading towards. So you're talking about the big changes in the sport. A guy that had a lot to do with that was uh, Dana White. You want to just give a quick opinion? Of well, Dana White, I mean, he is, he is the face of, he is the voice of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Um, I could be wrong in my percentages here, but I believe uh, he owns either 10 or 11 percent of that company. Now that 10 or 11 percent has made him a very wealthy man. And then the rest of the company was held by the Fertitta brothers. Uh, together all known as Zufa. Um, Stations Casino is where they were primarily, is primarily what they were based out of, out of Las Vegas. And uh, they lost a great deal of money before ever getting that, getting that industry off to the, off to the races. I, I think that they were close to a hundred million or more in debt. I think it was actually closer to two hundred million in debt. And again, I I don't remember what those exact figures are. To the point that they actually were thinking about selling that off. But once they cut that deal with Spike Television, and that very first Ultimate Fighter show took place, you had the match between Stephen Bonner versus Forrest Griffith. That for three five-minute rounds. Two young men just knocked the dog crap out of each other, and people couldn't believe how these two guys just kept striking each other, and yet they were smiling at each other and just kept it on going. And you know, people were were attracted to it. And I think both guys have been been inducted into their, their Hall of Fame, you know, due to that one match as well. And you actually fought for a Griffin once. You have any memories of that? Well, the very first time I was ever asked the question, so what are your, your memories of fighting Forrest Griffith? I go, Forrest who? Because it's like, we well, fought Forrest Griffith. I go, I did. And I go, I, I mean no, no disrespect for Forrest, but the victories just blended. And that's where today's viewer of this or today's athlete won't, won't understand this because the mixed martial art artists of today on a professional level mainly fight two to three times a year at most. I was fighting sometimes three and four times a month. So to recall one guy, no. Now the, the losses, oh, they are etched right up here because I, I can remember right at the point where I either mechanically let down something or I mentally let down on something. Those are etched into my mind. The victories, all blended. And I've heard you say before that your record isn't even accurate because when you were first starting out, a lot of those matches were not even counted. All of the, all of these watchdog websites, the sure dogs, the full contact fighters, any of them that actually follow the sport and say, this is what your record is. They didn't exist, did not exist until two, three, four years after the fact. And all they ever did was view one company, the Ultimate Fighting Championships. When no hose bar broke, person after person would, would hand me a card or hand me a pager. Most people watch this, they don't even know what a pager is now. Pagers, I guess you have to go to the Smithsonian Institute to see the pager is now. A little electronic device, beep, 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 has a phone number, go to the pay phone. Oh, that's right, we don't have pay phones anymore either. <laughs> you make, you call the number. And basically, there'll be a ticket waiting for you at an airport. Get on the airplane, you fly to a destination. People will be there to pick you up. They will take you yet to another destination. Well, there'll be food and festivities and you will be providing entertainment tonight because you'll be fighting another man. Now, one of the events that I did turn down was taking place just across the border to Mexico. And uh, as I told you before, this, uh, the Ultimate Fighting Championships at, at this time period, no host bar had the two rules. Well, this company wanted to be badder than even 
the ultimate fighting championships, they wanted no rules whatsoever. And you could wear cowboy boots and wear Levi jeans into the ring. Now the ring was going to be a cockfighting pit. They were going to start with roosters, progress to dogs, and main event with human beings, all spilling blood in the same ring. I turned that one down. I, it was awful good money, but I kept thinking, even if I should win. Did that end up happening? No, no, I, no, I turned that one down just because I, it, I kept thinking, even if I should win, would I make it out of that arena? Or would they find my body a few days later, maybe in some alleyway or something like that? So I, I turned that one down. So how did you uh, end up in the WWE from UFC? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, going from amateur wrestler to professional wrestler, then into cage fighter. I, I even though I was uh, working for the Ultimate Fighting Champ Championship at the time, I'm gonna say that really, say I only was working with them for a handful of matches. When No Holds Barred broke, you know, all kinds of other companies started uh, popping up left and right. On any given month, I could be on the road for easily 20 plus days. But I might be off uh, doing a cage fight one weekend. I might be doing a professional wrestling match the, the, uh, the following weekend. I might be teaching an amateur wrestling clinic here, a freestyle clinic there, a cracker roman clinic here, a mixed martial arts this, a submission grappling that. I've been doing law enforcement training since uh, 94, correction since 95, and since that time I've added stuff for Border Patrol, Air Marshal, and military. And those are things that uh, I think are really cool that I've been able to utilize my skill of, of teaching and understanding body mechanics to where it, it has transitioned me into all kinds of other sectors. To me, it's, it's just all teaching and understanding things. But uh, uh, WWE was the first group that, that well, actually, no, WCW was the first group that, that caught wind of me and brought me in. And then the WWF brought me in, into there. And then, uh, you know, I, I went back uh, twice to talk with, the, you know, that the WCW brought me in, talk with Bischoff and that. And then, uh, and, you know, we, I'd say that uh, WWF uh, and I were in negotiation for almost a year. Uh, Ken, they were in negotiation with both Ken Shamrock and I, but Ken went to work almost one year before me. He more or less said, for X amount of dollars, I'm yours. And I simply said that I wasn't going to put all my eggs into one basket. I, I wanted to be non-exclusive. And as far as I know, I am still the only athlete to ever be non-exclusive to them. Um, I mean, even in Brock Lesnar, he's not working for any other professional wrestling company. He's only working for one company, where at the time that I was working for the Ultimate Fighting Championship and any other cage fighting company that was going to book me. But then I was working for the NWA, Nash National Wrestling Alliance. And there were 30 some odd different promoter and promotions there alone. I was working for, so when people, when I tell people, yeah, I'd be on the road for 20 plus days a month. And there would be days when I, I woke up, simply to look at my planner and they had to uh, figure out where am I at and what is my function today? Am I a professional wrestler? Am I a cage fighter? Do I have to put on my law enforcement training uniform? Do I have to go and teach amateur wrestling this? Because each one has a different type of dynamics. So uh, when people ask me all the time when they, they meet you years later, hey Dan, do you remember me? I simply look at him and go, nope. Now, if you were like a cyclop, I'd remember that. Or if you had maybe your ear torn off or something like that, I'd remember that. But everyone else, they all just blend into the woodwork. So you still had cage fights while you were in WWE? Oh, yeah. yeah I was, well, part of my deal that I had with them was I knew my schedule. I had a minimum of 30 days ahead of time. So when I would fly into, let's say, New York City for a match at Madison Square Garden, I knew that ahead of time. So that I may fly in earlier that day. I might go do a seminar at one location. Go back over 
to Madison Square Garden, do my match. And then later that night, go and do an appearance at a sports bar to where my 24 hours is gone. But I pulled down three paychecks, not one. So to me, I thought that was just smart on my part. But uh, at the same token, um, you know, once we finally came to an agreement and we're in the office, here I am with, uh, with uh, Vince McMahon and uh, um, drawing a blanket right now. I can't believe Should I just... Didn't tell no, 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 no. One of, one of the, the best players. Jim Ross. Boy, I just can't be. I'm looking at his face in my mind. I just couldn't come up. Jim Ross in there. And, uh, you know, basically, you know, papers all been signed at the point in time. We're in there, you know, doing the old shaking the hands, side each other back, and more conversations taking place. And a couple of different t dates were thrown out there. And then Vince signed, finally just stops and goes, well, he says, how old are you, Dan? And I think I was 48 at the time. He looks back over to Jim Ross. He says, well, Jim, who's our oldest rookie ever? Jim didn't hesitate. He just goes, Dan. But I, at, I did not look my age, nor did I, did I act my age. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But, yeah, I, I've kind of been a, a, a breaker of barriers. You know, just the cage fighting world alone. You know, back in 1994, to be just, be, just before my first UFC ever going into, I, I was just prior to turning 37 years of age, who would start a cage fighting career at 37? No one would start that. They, they would have retired from that. But that's when opportunity presented itself. And I, I only ever planned on doing one. Because in my mind, I thought, well, on paper, it should kind of go like this. But what happens in the classroom, what happens for real, are two different things. And so the first one went just fine. Then I said, okay, I'll do the next one. Then I went into the first year, the fifth year, the tenth year, to basically I had just about a 20-year career in this industry. And, uh, you know, I always looked at it. It wasn't a career move for me. It was just a well-paying hobby because the money was not there. I always tell people, I signed a contract, and you've already heard the rules were two. Nobody knew eye gouging. Eight-man tournament. Had to face, face defeat three men in the course of the night. I would sign this contract, and in small print at the bottom, it would simply state in black and white, in the event of your accidental death, let's see, if I don't bite you, and I don't stick my fingers in your eyes, I think I can come up with a lot of other ways to take your life without ever violating those two rules. And my guarantee, my financial guarantee to step into that cage was $1,000. Now I like to think that my carcass is worth more than a grand. And after watching the first couple, I thought, well, worst case scenario, if things are going kind of bad for me, I can do the same called a tap out. And I figured that for a thousand bucks, it's not worth me jeopardizing my health and my life. And I actually have tapped out in a few matches. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Like I said, times have changed. I'm just ahead of my time at that time period. So uh, with wrestling, what were your overall dealings like with Vince McMahon uh, himself? Did you have much contact with him? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I'd say quite a quite a bit there into the beginning, into the in, in, intermediate stages. I actually, I think, I think what Vince appreciated about me is the fact that I was like that old school wrestler he had dealt with at one time, where your word and your handshake should mean something. And I actually th believe right now, if I made a phone call to the WWE, I do believe he would take my phone call just because I'm not going to waste his time. I used to have some of my, my guys that say, you think you could get us backstage passes? I go, yeah, but why would I ever ask for some, such a lowly type of a request? That's called a favor. And if I ask someone for a favor, I owe that person. 
I would never ask such a lowly favor like that. I, I, I would rather know that if I could maybe get you into a dark match or something like that, that would that would actually further your career. I'd be more interested in that because that's actually going to do something. Go buy a ticket otherwise. Yeah. So you never had any uh, negative dealings with him? No, I mean, uh, there. well, no, I won't, I won't say that either. I mean, it was, uh, there came a point in time, again, this was not really with Vince dealing with me. He had one of his road agents. Actually, <laughs> I, I, I go to two different stories here. I'll, if you can remind me about the Jim Cornette story, but uh, um, the aspect that I'm talking about right now is when we, I guess, started to part ways was as a professional wrestler, you usually go through the evolution of characters. You may start off as a baby face, a good guy, and odds are somewhere along the line you've got to turn into the heel, the bad guy. And that's the evolution of the sport. You've seen Hulk Hogan wearing the yellow and red as being, you know, everyone's hero to him being an N NWO wearing the black and white and having, you know, his face shadowed in with, uh, with what, what looked like a beard. But it was basically just whatever. Make, make up from Halloween there is what took place, but he still had the white mustache to go with it. But that's the evolution of a professional wrestler. And when I first came on the scene, I was basically known as a baby face, just, just a no-nonsense kind of baby face. Didn't have to wear no ridiculous outfits. Matter of fact, I wore the same stuff from the Ultimate Fighting Championships, and uh, I didn't cut no any ridic ridiculous promos and that. Uh, and so, now I've got one of the road agents pitching me an idea. We want to make you, we want to put 666 across your forehead. Mark of the beast. We want to make you an undertaker disciple and this and that. And as they're going on, I'm like, time out. Not going to happen. I live in small town USA. I don't want to have any repercussions against my family, nor my businesses, nor me. I said, I want to know that I can have my family out to dinner and I'm not going to have some crazy youth pastor or something like that coming over there trying to sprinkle holy water on me because they're buying into a certain storyline here. I said, I already had some preconceived ideas of what I could do, well, but I never got a chance to pitch my ideas. And then all of a sudden the road agent goes, you know, Dan, we could start using you poorly. I go, what does that mean exactly? He said, well, we could start having you lose matches. I go, that's true. You could ask me to lose a match. But then I pull out that contract. I go, where does it say on my contract I have to lose to anybody? What if I walk into your world of fantasy and turn fantasy into reality? Which one of your so-called stars or how many of your so-called stars am I going to make look pretty darn silly out there? And the Royal Rumble was coming up. And it even crossed my mind. WCW is still in existence. Maybe I'll go over and talk uh, to Eric Bischoff and to say, you know, when it's time for me to exit that ring, I'll turn fantasy into reality and I'll clear that ring just busting up everybody and their brother and then every 90 seconds waiting for fresh meat to come on down. Now, this is live. This is a pay-per-view. Now, with sheer numbers, they'll get me out of that ring but they haven't got me out of the arena yet. What could that have been worth for one night? I think easily a million plus dollars. But some people might not have ever booked me once again, but at the same token, maybe other groups would have booked me even that much more. Because I show people really what, what a word should be worth and not being uh, dicked over on things. There's, there's right ways of doing business and there's wrong ways of doing business. And I was being wronged, and and I know how I could have made it right. So in the end, you things just... worked out 
amicably, I say financially, and they have to do that, that goofball gimme because the reality is, had I done something like that, and then all of a sudden, the WWF would have dropped me, that's all people would have never remembered of me. I'm thinking, uh, it took me too long to build my legacy, to go out doing something like that. To me, it's like, I said, you know, even Vince made the comment, he goes, you know how much money you can make? I go, Vince, I already made money, that's not why I'm here. You know, the, the UFC had no type of notoriety. More people found out about the UFC. The UFC ought to be sending me uh, dividend checks because I've been one of their best goodwill ambassadors for continuing to spread the will about uh, mixed martial arts, about that company itself. And, uh, but, you know, like I said, I just, I, I'm okay with all the business decisions and what I've done in my past. So Jim Cornette was uh, managing you at that time, so yes. you, you wanted to tell a story about Well, I, I will, and that's kind of ironic because by next weekend, March 7th, I will actually be in Wilmington, North Carolina for a professional wrestling tribute to Jim Cornette. And so I started jotting down, excuse me, jotting down a couple of notes there because you know, they want me to be their MC, and, and I know why. And it's a dirty job because different speakers are going to get up there and they're going to go on forever. I've been to the Cauliflower Alley banquet there too, and there's some of these people that have not been out in the public's eye in a long time. And they get up from behind that podium and you can literally see the years melt away and there they are reliving a moment as if it was happening last night. But that last night might have been 30, 40 or more years ago. And so I, I've witnessed uh, uh, Terry Funk uh, have to do this job there in the past, and, and he's got a good sense of humor about him where he, he has to walk on over there and chuckle, yuck, yuck, and just say, you know, uh, and have to help them off the stage. So I kept thinking, well, I don't think that this should be that bad, but I, I will be more or less the, the MC slash enforcer of this. But the whole aspect of, uh, of, of this is that Jim and I's life have encountered each other on a number of times over the decades. And that was kind of ironic to, to have been for my very first belt ever in professional wrestling was in his promotion, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And to have done a match with Chris Candido. And that's where I ended up uh, getting the NWA belt first put on and then having brought out to the Ultimate Fighting Championships by Dennis Carluzzo. But then uh, meeting Jim Cornette again uh, in the WWE F, and then again in the Ring of Honor. I mean, it's uh, it, it. There's some great stories that come on into it. And I guess I guess the last one I'll say on this is that, and the, being in the WWF, I can't use some of the language that uh, Jim says here right now, but he was so frustrated. He came. I happened to be sitting in the cafeteria because the, the typical rule of conduct there was uh, they wanted the talent to show up some more between noon and one o'clock. They would actually would feed you, catered meals, stuff like this. And uh, they, they wanted you there so early. I, I can't figure, wanted to figure out why. It didn't take me too long to figure out. It's, be, it's because it was like a babysitting job. Because of the characters that were involved, they didn't, first off, would f try to find out who actually is going to show up. And if you did show up, and what kind of condition would you be in? Would you be underneath the influence of who knows what? Did you get hurt or, or did you lose your entire costume? I couldn't believe me. I looked at it as a glorified babysitting job. You could show up in some of the wor worst type of uh, shape and they could dust the circles out from underneath your eyes because they had, you know, uh, a cosmetic type of people. They could dye your hair. They could uh, put together an entire new costume for you if you lost all your stuff. It just kind of boggled my mind. I kept thinking, what a bunch of, of uh, what a band of derelicts, and this is just a babysitting type of monitor. I go, where else could you guys get paid this to uh, to do this? And so when when Jim was Jim was there, he came by me, and he's like, Danny goes, he says that creative team. He goes, and they frustrate me so bad. He goes, they don't have a clue to what to do with you. He goes, to me, you're the best gimmick. Just be it you. Just go down there. 
carries a belt, don't care about the belt, toss them off the side, and just dismantle people. This was before there was a Bill Goldberg in WCW. And ironically, it wasn't until maybe half a dozen or, or so years back I met Bill for the very first time. We had lunch along with a few other people. And as we get to know each other, halfway through lunch, he reaches over, taps me on the shoulder, and goes, thanks. I go, well, for what? He goes, dude, I was you. I go, what? He says, I watched you in the Ultimate Fight Champs. He says, I mimicked you. I am like, wow, that was pretty cool for him to say that to me. So, I mean, I kept thinking I was a Bill Goldberg <laughs> and who's next and all that before there ever was a Bill Goldberg. So, uh, were you disappointed overall with, with uh, how your run went there or? I'll say, me personally, was I disappointed? I mean, no, I, I made an awful lot of money in a very short period of time. Um, did they underutilize me? Yes. There was so much more that they could have done with me, but I think the sheer fact that they had no controlling mechanisms over me. I was carte blanche. I could do whatever I wanted. I only had to work so many dates for them. Average wrestler, I think, worked something like 170 or 180 dates a year. I worked 60. And I was not exclusive. I could work for anybody else including our tribal, but at the same token, what they don't understand is they're talking to an old school kind of guy. Are you going to bite the hand that feeds you? No, not someone that has integrity and intelligence, no. Now, I have seen some of the derelicts. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll let you fill in the blank as to who you think I'm talking about right now, that they continue to have, hang on to over the years that they've had to put in and out of rehab multiple times and that they keep paying them back and paying them outlandish money. Where else can these guys get a job like that? That you allow to screw up time and time again. No other industry and it's, I'll say that professionalism has taught me an awful lot, but it does not follow the most basic principles of business one on one. And you feuded with uh, Ken Shamrock in WWE. Uh, you want to just talk about uh, your history with Ken Shamrock, kind of in Ultimate Fighting, and then the, the feud that you had in WWE. Well, again, that's where I think that feud was kind of like magic and made up from the Ultimate Fighting Championship uh, in, the, in the beginning, and, and it was an easy carryover into the wacky world of professional wrestling. Did I ever really have a feud with a guy? No. And to me, it's like, I come from a world of uh, amateur wrestling competition, and to me, it's, uh, I'll shake your hand before, I'll shake your hand after, no hard feelings of what's about to happen. And, uh, you know, it's uh, just, I think things got kind of escalated in different aspects, or other people kind of fan calls when they, you know, seen opportunities. But, uh, you know, I, I just look at, the, there, there really is no rivalry. Even though we've had two matches, he won one, I won one. So going into WWF, to do the rubber match or to work on an angle was, it, it was an easy storyline to work with, but it never materialized. Also, Steve Blackman uh, was in, in the SA mix right along with, uh, um, the, boy, Owen Hart. Yeah, I'm gonna say I kept my say the Blue Blazer, <laughs> Blue Blazer, but Owen Hart. Um, Were you there that night? That no, I was not there that night. I mean, because that was one of the dates that I didn't have to be there on on that particular night. But I, I mean, I found out. Uh, I mean, I was getting uh, um, emails and stuff like that were coming in, and then I mean, within you know 24 hours, 48 hours afterwards, I'm doing interviews about that. And they're, they're, they're asking you questions about this, that, and the whole nine years. I'm thinking, you know, I wasn't there. To, I can't tell you any information. I said, you know, from all I found out is that it, it's a real tragedy what happened. And, uh, you know, one of, th one of three people will actually really know what happened because I guess there was a total of three people up in the scaffolding. Owen Hart was one of those three. 
So there's only two people left that actually probably know what really went down in that. Did you enjoy working with him? For oh, that I, time? I did. Uh, getting to know Owen, at first I heard different things, you know, just from different people. But, uh, you know, but just to me, it's like I, I never go by hearsay. I, I like to see what people actually, what, what, what materializes. He, uh, oh, he's a character. Uh, kind of a dry sense of humor. He liked to kind of just pull little pranks upon people, things of that nature. I, I mean, I enjoyed being, you know, there was a couple times that we were tag team partners, and I really enjoyed doing that against, you know, Blackman and uh, Kent. So, I mean, to me, it was, I could really see a sense of humor and how, Sometimes he had a hard time keeping that straight face because he was he was enjoying so much being that character. You know, whenever he, then the crowd would start to boo, I swear when the crowd would start to boo him, he loved it the most at that point in time. And when they were doing those angles of uh, getting the one uh, comedian come out dressed like him, the young man that had the big nose and stuff like this, and doing the same, saying the same lines and challenging him. You could always see that Owen had a hard time uh, just keeping a straight face while the magic of professional wrestling was taking place. And that's what it was. Those were some magical moments. And was WWE doing steroid testing at that time at all? No. Because you mentioned, uh, I've seen you mention in previous interviews, uh, that you think it's possible that Shamrock could have been on something po during your Possible? <laughs> the only reason I laugh about that, I mean, just, there's no possibility whatsoever. I mean, I've been involved in athletics my entire life. I know what a man and a woman can build naturally, and I know what they can build unnaturally. There's, if you just look at the world of bodybuilding, you look at natural bodybuilders and you look at professional level bodybuilders. These natural bodybuilders look like 98 pound weaklings compared to these professional level bodybuilders. Uh, if you ever want to see freak of sources, the first weekend of March, every single year, you have the Arnold Schwarzenegger Classic. I have been there so many times over the years. I'm actually always behind the booth as one of the attractions to bring in, to bring people up to yours. After, the fir after being there the first time, I kept thinking, I'm really not sure who the freak of sources are. I've been behind the booth and people are gazing at you, but then I'm seeing these people walk by and they've got, they've got arms like they came off of a gorilla. They've got legs that look like they're the hindquarters of a horse. And I'm talking about the women. I'm not even talking about the men, men yet. And you get these women that they look at you, and all of a sudden, out of this this feminine person, you have this "How's it going?" voice. I'm thinking, I'm looking for an Adam's apple or stuff like this. And now at this point, in time it just it's hard to believe. You can smell the testosterone in the air. So you would have liked to have had the third match with Shamrock under current testing. I, I made a comment at one point in time. This was, I'll say, somewhere to that that middle 90s towards the latter part of the 90s. A lot of people, you know, the email era was really coming on out. And some, uh, some of the so-called great fighters were making these big claims of fame that I can beat you and I can beat this person. And to me, I just simply put out an email that simply said, put up or shut up. Take $5,000 of each of your own money. Put it in the kitty. Let the UFC put out the biggest prize they've ever done. And winner take all situation. And I said, the only request I have is on the day of competition, all athletes must be tested. And those that test positive not be allowed to compete. Don Fry was the only man with balls to simply say, you would win undefeated, Dan. You would never break a sweat. And, and I, I take more respect from someone that will simply just flat out admit to it. You know, it's, it's you know, people, it, and don't get me wrong, steroids are in all sports. Find me an NFL football player that isn't on steroids. Again, I just say that you know as, as a broad stroke, but that might touch on a lot of people. But I still like to meet that guy. And uh, what do you think of Brock Lesnar's MMA career that he had? And also, do you think he's going to going to uh, 
return for another match in the UFC? I think that Brock Lesnar should just be count his lucky stars. He has been given opportunities that did he deserve? Nope. Count your lucky stars. I, I, you know, me personally, outside looking in, better stay with your professional wrestling. It'll be a lot easier on your body. How do you think uh, you and your prime would do against Brock Lesnar when he was in his prime? Well, <laughs> I would have gone up against anybody in my prime. You know, the UFC people were blown away with what I did at the time I did it. And as far as I was concerned, I was already 10 years past my prime already. So if people were so blown away, I go, that was called Dan Seven Residue. You should have seen me from 1984 to 1986, I ruled the world. But I, as I said earlier, I would have retired in 84 had things gone the way they should have gone. For the next two years, I had to exercise some demons within myself. I had to sort of come to peace with myself. And I did it at the expense of a number of opponents. And I ended a number of people's careers, probably even crippled a few people, legitimately. But I know how far the body is meant to bend before it breaks. Did I do anything illegal? Nope. But then again, you know, you'd be surprised what you can do with, with, with a good old power half to where you can actually take a man's shoulder right out of socket. And I've done that. So, so these are demons I'll, I'll live with, but uh, not really too proud of that, that portion of my career, but uh, had politics not prevailed it would have been a whole different story of my career we wouldn't be sitting there doing this interview right now but I always say that life kind of throws you curveballs some dead end roads and how do you as a person respond do you just lay down and cry and give up or do you pick yourself up dust yourself off and climb right back in that ring one more time. Do you think uh, MMA is still getting more popular or do you think it's reached its pinnacle and as more sanctions come in it's going to be harder to develop stars? And No, I, I think that the sport of mixed martial arts has more room to grow until there is a Super Bowl style of annual event. Until there's a WrestleMania style event for this, where you can take the top heavyweights from various promotions, the top guys from Bellator versus the top guys from the USC versus the top guys from uh, the, the Gladiator Challenge versus the top guys from King of the Cage and on and on. Then the sport might reach a utopia. The biggest problem there is dealing with owners egos oh and Ken Shamrock versus Kimbo Slice prediction hmm I would almost buy a ticket to watch that with almost <laughs> um you know I will give the stand-up game to Kimbo Slice Ken will have to get to a clinch. Ken will have to get get a takedown. If it goes around, it's Ken. If it stays on the feet, it's Kimbo. Again, I don't, I, I'm not saying that just be mean people. I just I'm looking at what I feel both people's strengths are, and that's 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 the beast prediction. Excellent. Yeah, I got one question for you. What's yeah. your proudest moment? in your entire professional and amateur career, if there was one... Yeah, no, I can't. I, there's, there would never be one thing I could ever, I could ever point out. I, I've had uh, 
I've been writing a book for well over a decade now. The problem is I have too much content. I, mean, I have over a thousand pages, but on one page alone, I might just have three or four lines that'll simply say something like Leipzig, East Germany, Russian negotiations, lots of vodka. Now, <laughs> those <laughs> those three or four lines represents probably a 15 to 20 page story. First off, there is no East Germany anymore. There used to be. There used to be in East and West. I was there in East Germany three different times uh, for competition's sake and to see the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall. And to understand, speaking to people, the mentality of being caged in, not caged out, but to be caged in, a whole different type of mentality. So it's been, uh, I'll just say, moments of time is what was really what I can come up. I've had different moments of time in my amateur wrestling career, much like uh, in my professional wrestling career, much like in my cage fighting career, and just in life in general. Actually, I have one more question, just because I have a few minutes left on here. Okay, so you're known as a tough guy, obviously, being a professional wrestler. Well, known as the Beast, believe it or not, and I'm thinking, I didn't make up my ring name. It was actually bestowed upon me by the legendary football player, Jim Brown. I wear glasses. I mean, Jim Brown, I mean, uh, the NFL Hall of Fame, uh, uh, looked upon as one of the most punishing running backs in the history of the game. Now, in my opinion, he was the... He retired at a young age that took three other men an additional decade of playing time just to beat his record. And, he, and Jim Brown didn't run around people, he ran over people. So again, it just puts, puts him into a little bit different category. So he was one of the play-by-play -play, uh, commentators for, I don't know, half a dozen other events. And uh, I wore glasses for distance. And he, he even admitted, like I said, the well, first time I met you there, Dan, he goes, I didn't think very much of you because he goes, you're pretty meek, mild manner. He says, but then you climb into this cage. He says, it reminds me of Clark Kent slash Superman. How you go from Meek Mountain to Don Don Don? How you turn this on? He goes, how do you do that? I'm thinking Jim Brown is asking me a question like this. I got kind of giddy like a little schoolgirl there because you know I watched him when I was in high school and when he was in the NFL. So, uh, but in in his closing comments from UFC four to UFC five, he he said. When Dan Severn first came on the scene, he was so technical, so clinical. He was just a wrestler. But now he's so aggressive. He's punching. He's doing that. And he's doing this. He goes, he's like an animal. He's like a beast. And that's Dan to be Severn. Endorsed by Jim Brown. But if anyone knows me, knows what a positive person I am. And the beast has a lot of negative connotations. So the word the stands for Dan Severn. I'm a teacher, he humanitarian, and I'm an educator. And my message to young people is beast. To believe in yourself, to educate yourself, to adjust your everyday attitude, to study hard, and then to teach others. So the beast it's a double-edged sword. So, so you never got 666 on your forehead, but you ended up no. with the beast anyways. So yeah, exactly. A Trust me, you'd be surprised how many times I've been invited to so many different uh, churches. And I'm thinking, huh, <laughs> isn't this kind of coincidental that the beast is in the house? <laughs> and I even had one match where I went up against a youth pastor, and it was simply dubbed the priest versus the beast.